World News Group has published a piece, which I'll provide a link to, which is where I got the title for today's show, The Battle for America's Identity. Their subtitle is the topic of our monologue today. It reads, Does Christian nationalism hold the key to the country's past and its future? Let's talk about it. And as always, I I would love to see you leave your thoughts and questions in the comments, but I encourage you to go read that piece by Sharon Deerberger and Emma Freyer. It covers a wide surface on the subject, but we're going to go for depth on the subject, and I think you'll see why when we're done. At the recent State of the Union address, President Biden closed with the following statement. Again and again, I've seen the contest between competing forces and the battle for the soul of our nation, between those who want to pull America back to the past and those who want to move America into the future. But you can't lead America with ancient ideas. That only takes us back. To lead America, the land of possibilities, you need a vision for the future of what America can and should be. The United States of America faces what is perhaps its most important decision, an identity crisis, the likes of which we've never seen in our relatively short history. Who are we? This is an incredibly important question. Our national identity ultimately determines who we are at home and abroad. It's only detrimental to have split personalities, or the the mental depravity comparable to dysphoria. This is something which was once easily definable, but now it's harder than ever to specify or clarify what it means to be an American. We don't even know who we are anymore. However, what's more important than who we are now is deciding who we will become. What will be the American identity? The answer to this question is the same thing as providing solutions to our national problems. It's like saying, in order to solve the issues of the United States, this is who we will be. And there are shockingly few specific answers to this question of national identity and solving our problems. The weak, vague, and actually crippling answer to this question for decades has been to erase our identity or pretend as if we must eradicate the America that once was and clothe ourselves with and put on the mentality of cultures exterior to the United States. I'm telling you, this is what has been happening in our college classes for decades. This is why, and and you really understand this if you're an, an older American, The feeling of of national lostness is almost palpable. You can feel it, and you can feel even more so if, if, like I said, you're an older American. I don't think the world, the world doesn't even know who we are now. America was once viewed a certain way, her citizens in in a generalized way. In other words, not only are we lost on our own identity, No one knows who we are anymore. Since when are we a nation who treats our own populace the way that we do? Equality is draining from our culture like sand in an hourglass. And speaking of culture, there's no such thing as American culture anymore because we no longer encourage or expect assimilation. Racism is the most pervasive it's been in over half a century. The justice system is an oxymoron condemning the innocent and rewarding the guilty. Faith in God is taboo, but public satanic worship is artistic and brave and acceptable. Love of country is taboo as well, since hatred of the country is now fashionable. And this is to the point of tearing down historic statues and allowing demonstrations of mobs chanting death to America, burning our flags. It is now virtuous to be unvirtuous. It is now moral to be immoral. 
And it is now freedom to enslave yourself to sin. This is the confused, unrecognizable, mentally ill, and morally depraved identity America has become. It didn't used to be this way. And I'm most assuredly not saying that America has ever been perfect. But we've gone from a slow walk into a staggering sprint toward our own destruction. Perhaps there are answers to our identity crisis in the past when America was much healthier. And maybe there are things there we can build upon to define our future and heal our land. In the last 20 years, but especially since Trump was in office, a certain terminology has come come forth and is constantly spoken of in our national media and in conversations around political ideology and national identity, and that is Christian nationalism. In all truth, this is a very bloated term. It means different things depending on the context or the person saying it. But the truth is, there are two subjective uh, definitions to this terminology. One of them, very extreme, and the other is what we'll spend most of our time talking about today. So in the context of the American identity, liberals and their PR department in the mainstream media have created a caricature of their political enemies in what they call a Christian nationalist. These are mostly white, male Christians, with the exception of a handful of Uncle Toms and some congresswomen who seek to force Christianity and the Christian identity and way of life onto the populace of the United States. In fact, these Christian nationalists want to transform America from a constitutional democratic republic to a theocracy governed by the Bible and a divinely elected leader. In most cases, this terminology is always used as a scare tactic, electorally speaking, but the truth is that people with this general mentality are as scarce as QAnon or neo-Nazis here in America. So, just to be clear, I know that these people actually exist. (laughs) I'm not denying that. But this is largely a fictional character the liberals have created for political strategy. And this is, in part, successful due to the cultural and historical baggage of these two terms, Christian and nationalist. Christianity, in its realness, is the enemy of secularism. But this is to be expected in spiritual warfare. Christianity and culture will, for the rest of time, be at war with each other. Good versus evil, light versus dark, etc. So, as American culture has been progressively secularized, the term Christian has accumulated negative connotations and cultural baggage. But what about the other term, nationalism? Nationalism is literally defined as loyalty and devotion to a nation, exalting one nation above all others, and placing primary emphasis on promotion of its culture and interests as opposed to those of other nations or supranational groups. Okay, let's process that in pieces. First, there's this definition of loyalty and devotion to a nation, which sounds pretty similar to Patriotism, which we'll talk more about in just a moment. And then there's the part of the definition which describes exalting one nation above all others. This, at least in the American sense, is what we would describe as exceptionalism, which, to borrow a a modern movement's designation, this is like the America First policy. The idea with this being that we, we take care of us first and foremost. We take care of our business before we get into anyone else's, or we we take care of our own people before we take care of anyone else's people. 
Now, the end of the definition speaks to an emphasis on promoting a nation's culture and interests, but hold on to that. At its core, nationalism is the belief that the nation is a distinct community with its own history, culture, language, territory. It can promote a strong sense of collective identity and belonging. This collective national identity being that which distinguishes the nation from other nations. Now listen, this this is all very important. Nationalism fosters sovereignty and autonomy of the nation, asserting its its right to self-governance, territorial integrity, and independence from external control or interference. Nationalism also seeks to unify and solidify the populace, transcending differences. Hello, transcending differences and divisions among the nation's people. It promotes the idea of a common destiny and encourages cooperation among the nation's people in achieving the shared goals of the country. And as I've already mentioned, nationalism is closely related to patriotism because it promotes a sense of pride and loyalty, history, achievements, and heritage. So why is it that nationalism is 99.99% of the time spoken of as a negative idea. Well, because on numerous occasions in history, nationalism has been utilized for the worst of human atrocities, to use a word that the liberals love to use. Nazi Germany is the most atrocious example. There was extreme German nationalism, which glorified the Germanic Aryan race, which sought its spread throughout Europe and led to the extermination of more than 6 million Jews. This is happening in Africa right now. The 20th century Japanese imperialism can be explained in similar fashion. Now ask yourself, how is it that nationalism manifested itself so poorly in these places to the world's detriment? Well, that's because these nations' core values and who they were, their identities, were dreadful and corrupt. And it's no coincidence that these corrupt nationalists were utterly defeated by an opposing nation whose identity presented much better values than Nazism, Japanese imperialism, and African ethnic cleansing. So, all this to say... Nationalism is a good thing if if the nation's ideas and values represent goodness. But if being patriotic means hating a race of people, so much so you support your government exterminating them from the earth, literally, then that nationalism is without question abhorrent and should be defeated. Well now, what about Christian nationalism? nationalism. Has there ever been such a thing? Has there ever been a a nation whose collective identity was Christian, who promoted biblical unity, and, and who fostered the Christian forms of pride and independence and liberty and loyalty, goals and heritage? Has there ever been a nation which simply abused the Christian identity for tyranny or authoritarian control? Well, the answer is yes to both of those. And in fact, the latter is what created the former. The United States is the only nation in the history of the world to be a Christian nation, as we understand genuine Christianity and nationalism, or at least it was the closest anyone has ever gotten to that. Now, this is why we started by accurately defining nationalism. The Catholic Church was the dominant force in the Middle Ages across Europe. It had enormous political and social influence, and in many cases even had legal and moral authority. However, because of the corruption of the Catholic Church, time and time again, its influence dwindled, 
ultimately resulting in the Reformation, which was a monumental event in the foundation of America. All this to say, a terrible form of Christian nationalism actually begot an incredible form of Judeo-Christian nationalism in the creation of the United States. And this is where we see the first nation governed by and founded upon the Judeo-Christian concept of liberty and God-given rights. John Locke's Second Treatise of Government was the main source of inspiration in Jefferson's writing, the Declaration of Independence. Locke's treatise was heavily inspired by Judeo-Christian thought. The idea that all humans are created equal and possess natural rights stem from biblical principles dating all the way back to the creation of man in Genesis. Most importantly, though, Locke's inspiration for individual liberty and property rights stem from biblical principles on stewardship and responsibility and private property. Now, there are are two other things in relation to liberty that demonstrate what was the Founding Fathers' concept of liberty, but I've already done a full episode on the subject back in January. It was called The Divine Limits of Liberty. And in that episode, I explained that uh, the biblical concept of liberty, that it's, it's not in any way, shape, or form a pass to just do whatever you please. Christian liberty means freedom from the bondage of sin and death, not the freedom to sin and death. Paul speaks so much about the Christian's freedom in Christ. But let's look at the words of the Messiah himself in John 8, 34 and 36, which says, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. If the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Now, this is the confounding thought. Real freedom is freedom from sin and the unbearable weight of living up to the perfect standards of a righteous God. Not a license to indulge in sinful behavior. And and that's, that's the confounding part. The secular definition of freedom is the ability to do whatever you desire. But in doing so, you're actually making yourself a slave to sin, which isn't isn't freedom at all. It's a total paradox. That's why I explain in that episode, which we'll link to, that true liberty only exists within boundaries. In societies, we call these laws. Laws are the boundaries to preserve liberty in America. So when Jefferson wrote, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This was the Judeo-Christian backdrop for his writing. In other words, the Christian concept of liberty was the foundational stone for the United States of America. James Madison wrote the preamble as follows. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. There's that blessed liberty they wish to secure for themselves and their descendants. Then... The Bill of Rights would come along soon after that. Madison wrote the Liberty Amendments, the first of which reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So now that you can see the proper understanding of liberty, these Liberty Amendments were not a license to do whatever you want, religiously or in your speech or with the press or with assembly or government questioning. There are laws and codes and statutes regulating every one of these things. Perhaps 
The one most important for our conversation today is the Establishment Clause, or the Free Exercise Clause, which gets shortened to freedom of religion. Before I explain this, though, we have to understand that the main purpose of the Bill of Rights was to limit the powers of the government, or to regulate the federal government. But the First Amendment was ratified in December of 1791. But the precursor to freedom of religion was a Virginia statute written by Thomas Jefferson over a decade earlier. In fact, James Madison helped him write this. But the statute declared that no Virginian should be compelled or forced to attend or support any church because Virginians weren't happy about their taxes supporting the the local Church of England. This is where the separation of church and state doctrine comes from, and it's where the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause come from. Again, I've done an entire lesson on the separation doctrine back in August, which we'll also link to. This idea, opposing spiritual or religious tyranny, is consistent with the Judeo-Christian understanding of the nature of God. And just to be clear, I know that some of my Calvinist friends will disagree with me on this, but that's okay. As Christians, we believe that love is something that comes from the very nature of God. It's who He is. He he is love. And His Word attests to this in 1 John 4, 8. This is the same God who gives us life and liberty, possessions and property. However, In God's loving nature, He chooses not to force Himself onto us. He doesn't make us obedient to Him either, because that's inconsistent with His nature. That's why He gives us choices. That's why He gave the very first people the freedom to choose, the liberty to be obedient or not. It's also in His love that He doesn't prevent our consequences. Adam and Eve began their death the day they chose not to worship God above all. And the same is true for us. In other words, God doesn't force people to be Christian, and we can't either because that's what we call tyranny. And the Founding Fathers created a system which reflected God's blessing of liberty. So, why did the founders establish such a Judeo-Christian nation? Why did they create as our societal foundation and, and like a governmental box or boundary a heavily Judeo-Christian system? Would this not be a violation of the very rules they created? You know, the founders were largely Christian, but not all of them. George Washington and James Madison were Episcopalians. John Adams and Samuel Adams were a part of a a Reformed denomination known as Congregationalism. Thomas Jefferson was a deist. So was Ben Franklin. They believed in some sort of higher power like God, but rejected the claims of Christianity. And this was because they valued reason over revelation, which obviously rejects the miraculous. Um, Alexander Hamilton was a Protestant Christian. So was John Jay. Patrick Henry was an Anglican. I mean, that's a pretty religious bunch and a largely Christian group who created the United States of America. Some of our oldest universities began as seminaries. Harvard was founded in 1636 to train ministers, Puritan ministers. Yale was founded in 1701 to educate Congregationalist ministers, and Princeton was founded in 1746 to train Presbyterian ministers. All of our earliest hospitals in America were founded by Christians, as was the case with orphanages. Slavery was abolished, and civil rights were established because of Judeo-Christian values and influence. I think you get the point that America 
used to be a hopeful bastion of Christian nationalism, which was devoid of all its negative connotations. Even the sizable mass of immigrants from around the world knew this, and they came anyway because Christian liberty is the greatest liberty there is because it's created and manufactured by the Almighty God. Now, I want you to hear me very clearly when I say this. And this is the point of all my religious and historical rambling. This is what we mean by Christian nationalism. It's just not the way that we say it. We don't say the words Christian nationalism. We don't call ourselves a Christian nationalist. Christians just want to see the United States of America return to its Judeo-Christian roots. We want to see virtuosity return to public and private life. We want to see justice and order. We want to see respect and honor and reverence. We want to see an outright preservation of life no matter what. We want to see honesty and integrity, safety for everyone. We want to see evil punished and the good rewarded. This is what we long for. And and we're not alone in this. The Christians aren't alone in this. Even people who are atheist and or ag- agnostic in other faiths recognize the stability, prosperity, and harmony that stems from a Christian society. The world's most renowned atheist just recently said as much. He, he called himself a, a cultural Christian. In other words, a, a lot of people would love to see the United States become a Christian nation again. But here's the difference between the majority of us and the fringe political caricature the Democrats and liberals speak of. We, the real Christians, we will never force Christianity upon anyone because it defies God-given liberty. That's exactly what the founders thought. Instead, we will use legal process argument, and reasonable debate to establish a Christian nation, a city on a hill, and you can't prevent that from happening. Now, let me say something to the Christians listening. You're witnessing our country's casual demise and, in turn, the world's slow slip into madness and destruction. These two things are unmistakably linked. But what is also unmistakable is that it is our own failure to be the salt and light of the earth, which has caused most of this. And this is explained by our failure to be a church which is holy and set apart and our acceptance of secularization, secularism, So this revival that we wish to see in America is contingent upon our own revival. Listen to what God said to King Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7, 12-14. I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locust to devour the land, Or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. America is undoubtedly experiencing the judgment of God. There's no question about that. But here is God giving Solomon step-by-step directions on how to turn things around 
And it begins with humbling ourselves, Christians. We have to get off our high horses, admit our sins, admit our failures, and humble ourselves. But unfortunately, we can't fix what we've broken and and what we've allowed to be broken. So then step two is to pray and seek His face, which is to pray according to the will of God. The next and final step, which is arguably the most important, is repentance. Christians have to stop sinning. We have to start living righteously and set apart, which is usually the total opposite of how the world conducts itself. I'm not saying that Christians can be perfect people. I'm talking about laying aside the old self and anything that ensnares us. I'm talking about cutting off a hand or plucking out an eye to keep from stumbling into hell, metaphorically speaking, of course. Taking drastic steps is what that means. Taking drastic steps to avoid sin and temptation. And I'm telling you, this is impossible to do alone. We have to do this as a community. You have to have someone to walk alongside you in your journey toward Christ-likeness. We have to confess our sins to one another and institute the most severe boundaries we've ever fathomed. That's how you effectively turn from wickedness with permanence. When we've done these three things, humbled ourselves, uh, prayed desperately to the Lord, and have repented, then, then God will hear us, will forgive us, and will restore the United States of America. Thanks for watching this clip. Listen, I want to make sure that you stay informed on the news and the biblical response to it. So do yourself and us a favor and hit the subscribe button before you go. And then we would love for you to go check out wethefreeshow.com to grab yourself some merch to spread the word of We The Free. And we're also going to put a video that we think you'll like on the screen. Now, go and be that salt and light, and we'll see you next time.